Chapter 1 of The Book of Buried Treasure This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Buried Treasure by Ralph Delahaye Payne Chapter 1 The Worldwide Hunt for Vanished Riches the language has no more boldly romantic words than pirate and galleon, and the dullest imagination is apt to be kindled by any plausible dream of finding their lost treasures hidden on lonely beach or tropic key, or sunk fathoms deep in salt water. In the preface of their rare and exceedingly diverting volume, The Pirate's Own Book, the unnamed author sums up the matter with so much gusto and with so gorgeously appetizing a flavor that he is worth quoting to this extent. With the name of pirate is also associated ideas of rich plunder, caskets of buried jewels, chests of gold ingots, bags of outlandish coins secreted in lonely, out-of-the-way places, or buried about the wild shores of rivers and unexplored sea coasts, near rocks and trees bearing mysterious marks, indicating where the treasure was hid. And, as it is his invariable practice to secrete and bury his booty, and from the perilous life he leads being often killed or captured he can never revisit the spot again therefore immense sums remain buried in those places and are irrevocably lost search is often made by persons who labor in anticipation of throwing up with their spade and pickaxe gold bars diamond crosses sparkling amongst the dirt bags of golden doubloons and chests wedged close with moid ores ducats and pearls but although great treasures lie hid in this way, it seldom happens that any is recovered. In this tamed prosaic age of ours, treasure-seeking might seem to be the peculiar province of fiction, but the fact is that expeditions are fitting out every little while, and mysterious schooners flitting from many ports, lured by grimy, tattered charts, zoom the show where the horrors were hidden, or steering their courses by nothing more tangible than legend and surmise. As the kid, tradition survives along the Atlantic coast, so on divers shores of other seas persist the same kind of wild tales, the more convincing of which are strikingly alike, and that the lone survivor of the red-handed crew, having somehow escaped the hanging, shooting, or drowning that he handsomely merited, preserved a chart showing where the treasure had been hid. Unable to return to the place, he gave the parchment to some friend or shipmate, this dramatic transfer usually happening at a deathbed ceremony. The recipient, after digging in vain and heartily damning the departed pirate for his misleading landmarks and bearings, handed the chart down to the next generation. It will be readily perceived that this is the stock motive of almost all buried treasure fiction, the trademark of a certain brand of adventure story. But it is really more entertaining to know that such charts and records exist and are made use of by expeditions of the present day. Opportunity knocks at the door. He who would gamble in shares of such a speculation may find sunburned, tarry gentlemen from Seattle to Singapore and from Cape Town to New Zealand eager to whisper curious information of charts and sailing directions and to make sail on a way. Some of them are still seeking booty lost on Cocos Island off the coast of Costa Rica where a dozen expeditions have futilely sweated and dug. Others have cast anchor in harbors of Guam and the Carolines. While as you run from Aden, to Vladivostok, sailor men are never done with spinning yarns of treasure buried by the pirates of the Indian Ocean and the China Sea. Up from Callao, the treasure hunters fare to Clipperton Island, or the Galapagos group, where the buccaneers with Dampier and Davis used to careen their ships. And from Valparaiso, many an expedition has found its way to Juan Fernandez and Magellan Straits. The top sails of these salty Argonauts have been sighted in recent years off the salvages to the southward of Madeira, where two million of Spanish gold were buried in chests, and pick and shovel have been busy on rocky Trinidad in the South Atlantic, which conceals vast stores of plate and jewels left there by pirates who looted the galleons of Lima. Near Cape Fadal, on the coast of Zululand, lies the wreck of the notorious sailing vessel. Dorothea, in whose hold is treasure to the amount of two million dollars in gold bars concealed beneath a flooring of cement. It was believed for some time that the ill-fated Dorothea was fleeing with the fortune of Oompa Kruger on board when she was cast ashore. The evidence goes to show, however, 
as certain officials of the Transvaal government before the Boer War issued permits to several lawless adventurers, allowing them to engage in buying stolen gold from the mines. This illicit traffic flourished largely, and so successful was this particular combination that a ship was bought, the Ernestine, and after being overhauled and renamed the Dorothea, she secretly shipped the treasure on board in Delagoa Bay. It was only the other day that a party of restless young Americans sailed in the old racing yacht Mayflower, bound out to seek the wreck of a treasure galleon on the coast of Jamaica. The vessel was dismasted and abandoned at sea, and they had all the adventure they yearned for. One of them, Roger Derby of Boston, of a family fame for its deep-water mariners in the olden times, ingenuously confessed some time later, and here you have the spirit of the true treasure-seeker. I'm afraid that there is no information accessible in documentary or printed form of the wreck we investigated a year ago. Most of it is hearsay, and when we went down there on a second trip after losing the Mayflower, we found little to prove that a galleon had been lost, barring some old cannon, flint rock ballast, and square iron bolts. We found absolutely no gold. The coast of Madagascar, once haunted by freebooters who plundered the rich East India men, is still ransacked by treasure seekers, and American soldiers in the Philippines indefatigably excavate the landscape of Luzon in the hope of finding the hoard of Spanish gold buried by the Chinese Mandarin Chan Lucy in the 18th century. Every island of the West Indies and port of the Spanish Main abounds in legends of the mighty sea rogues whose hard fate it was to be laid by the heels before they could squander the gold that had been won with cutlass, boarding pike, carronade. The spirit of true adventure lives in the soul of the treasure hunter. The odds may be a thousand to one that he will unearth a solitary doubloon, yet he is lured to undertake the most prodigious exertions by the keen zest of the game itself. The English novelist, George R. Sims, once expressed this state of mind very exactly. Respectable citizens, tired of the melancholy sameness of a drab existence, cannot take the crepe masks, dark lanterns, silent matches, and rope ladders, but they can all be off to a pirate island and search for treasure and return laden or empty without a stain upon their characters. I know a fine old pirate who sings a good song and has treasure islands at his fingers' ends. I think I can get together a band of adventurers, middle-aged men of established reputation, in whom the public would have confidence, who would be only too glad to enjoy a year's romance. Robert Louis Stevenson, who dearly loved a pirate and wrote the finest treasure story of them all, were on a proper chart of his own devising, took Henry James the task for confessing that although he had been a child, he had never been on a quest for buried treasure. Here is indeed a woeful paradox, exclaimed the author of Treasure Island, where if he has never been on a quest for buried treasure, it can be demonstrated that he has never been a child. There never was a child, unless Master James, but has hunted gold, and been a pirate, and a military commander, and a bandit of the mountains, but has fought, and suffered shipwreck and prison, and imbrued its little hands in gore, and gallantly retrieved a lost battle, and triumphantly protected innocence and beauty. Mark Twain also indicated the singular isolation of Henry James by expressing precisely the same opinion in his immortal chronicle of the adventures of Tom Sawyer. There comes a time in every rightly constructed boy's life when he has a raging desire to go somewhere and dig for buried treasure. And what an entrancing career Tom had planned for himself in an earlier chapter. At the zenith of his fame, how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church, brown weather-beaten in his black velvet doublet and trunks, his great jack-boots, his crimson sash, his belt bristling with horse pistols, his crime-rusted cutlass at his side, his slouch hat waving plumes, his black flag unfurled with skull and crossbones on it, and here was swelling ecstasy, the whisperings. It's Tom Sawyer the pirate, the black avenger of the Spanish main. When Tom and Huck Finn went treasure-seeking, they observed the time-honored rules of the game, as the following dialogue will call to mind. Well, we dig, said Hut. Oh, almost anywhere. Why, is it hid all around? No, indeed it ain't, 
It's hid in mighty particular places, Huck. Sometimes on islands, sometimes in rotten chests under the limb of an old dead tree, just where the shadow falls at midnight, but mostly under the floor and on the houses. Who hides it? Why, robbers, of course. Who'd you reckon? Sunday school superintendents? I don't know. If twas mine, I wouldn't hide it. I'd spend it and have a good time. So would I, but robbers don't do it that way. They always hide it and leave it there. Don't they come after it any more? No, they think they will, but they generally forget the marks or else they die. Anyway, it lays there a long time and gets rusty. And by and by, somebody finds an old yellow paper that tells how to find the marks. A paper that's got to be ciphered over about a week because it's mostly signs and hieroglyphics. Hunting Lost Treasure is not work, but a fascinating kind of play that belongs to the world of make-believe. It appeals to that strain of boyishness which survives in the average man, even though it's probably frosted, his reputation starched and conservative. It is, after all, an inherited taste handed down from the golden age of fairies. The folklore of almost every race is rich in buried treasure stories. The pirate with a stout sea chest hidden above a high water mark is lineally descended from the enchanting characters who lived in the Shadowland of myth and fable. The horde of Captain Kidd, although he was turned off at Execution Dock only 200 years ago, has become as legendary as the dream of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Many a hard-headed farmer and fisherman of the New England coast believes that it is rash business to go digging for kid's treasure unless one carefully performs certain incantations designed to placate the ghostly guardian who four times sailed with kid and was slain by him after the hole was dug, lest the secret might thus be revealed. And it is, of course, well known that if a word is spoken after the pick has clinked against the iron-bound chest or metal pot, the devil flies away with the treasure, leaving behind him only panic and a strong smell of brimstone. Such curious superstitions as these, strongly surviving wherever pirate gold is sought, have been the common property of buried treasure stories in all ages. Country folk of Japan will tell you that if a pot of money is found, a rice cake must be left in place of every coin taken away, an imitation money burned as an offering to any spirit that may be offended by the removal of the hoard. Negroes of the West Indies explain that buried wealth of the buccaneers is seldom found, because the spirits that watch over it have a habit of whisking the treasure away to parts unknown as soon as ever the hiding place is disturbed. Among the Bedouins is current a legend that immense treasures were concealed by Solomon beneath the foundations of Palmyra, and that sapient monarch took the precaution of enlisting an army of jinns to guard the gold forevermore. Parts of Bohemia, peasants are convinced that a blue light hovers above the location of buried treasure, visible to all mortal eyes, save those of the person destined to find it. In many corners of the world there has long existed a belief the occult efficacy of a black cock or a black cat in the equipment of a treasure quest, which is also influenced by the particular phases of the moon. A letter written from Bombay as long ago as 1707 contained a quaint account of an incident inspired by this particular superstition. Upon a dream of a negro girl of Mahim, that there was a mine of treasure, who being overheard relating it, Domo, Alvarez, and some others went to the place and sacrificed a cock and dug the ground, but found nothing. They go to Bandara at Salset, who disagreeing, the government there takes notice of the same. And one of them, an inhabitant of Bombay, is sent to the Inquisition at Goa, which proceedings will discourage the inhabitants. Wherefore the general is desired to issue a proclamation to release him, and if not restored in twenty days, no Roman Catholic worship to be allowed on the island. A more recent chronicler, writing in the Salon Times, had this to say. It is the belief of all Orientals that hidden treasures are under the guardianship of supernatural beings. The Singhalese divide the charge between the demons and the Cobra de Capello, guardian of the king's Ancus in Kipling's story. Various charms are resorted to by those who wish to gain the treasure because the demons require a sacrifice. The blood of a human being is the most important, but so far as is known, the Capellos have hitherto confined themselves to the sacrifice of a white cock, combining its blood with their own drawn from the hand or foot. No more fantastic than this are the legends of which the British Isles yield a plentiful harvest. 
Thomas of Walsingham tells the tale of a Saracen physician who betook himself to Earl Warren of the 14th century to ask courteous permission that he might slay a dragon, or loafy worm, which had its den at Bromfield near Ludlow and had wrought sad ravages on the Earl's lands. The Saracen overcame the monster, whether by means of his medicine chest or his trusty steel, the narrator saith not. And then it was learned that a great hoard of gold was hidden in its foul den. Some men of Herefordshire sailed forth by night to search for the treasure, and were about to lay hands on it when retainers of the Earl of Warwick captured them and took the booty to the Lord. Blankensop Castle is haunted by a very sorrowful white lady. Her husband, Brian D. Blankensop, was uncommonly greedy of gold, which he loved better than his wife, and she, being very jealous and angry, was mad enough to hide from him a chest of treasure so heavy that twelve strong men were needed to lift it. Later she was overtaken by remorse because of this undutiful behavior, and to this day her uneasy ghost flits about the castle, supposedly seeking the spirit of Brian to Blinkensop, in order that she may tell him what she did with his pelf. When Corf Castle in Dorsetshire was besieged by Cromwell's troops, Lady Banks conducted a heroic defense. Betrayed by one of her own garrison, and despairing of holding out longer, she threw all the plate and jewels into a very deep well in the castle yard, and pronounced a curse against anyone who should try to find it ere she returned. She then ordered the traitor to be hanged, and surrendered the place. The treasure was never found, and perhaps later owners had been afraid of the militant ghost of Lady Banks. From time immemorial, tradition had it that a great treasure was buried near the kibble in Lancashire. The saying had been handed down that anyone standing on the hill at Walton Laydale and looking up the valley toward the site of ancient Rochester would gaze over the greatest treasure that England had ever known. Digging was undertaken at intervals during several centuries, until in 1841 laborers accidentally excavated a mass of silver ornaments, armlets, neck chains, amulets, and rings, weighing together about a thousand ounces, and more than seven thousand silver coins, mostly of King Alfred's time all enclosed in a leaden case, only three feet beneath the surface of the ground. Many of these ornaments and coins are to be seen at the British Museum. On a farm in the Scotch parish of Lesmahego is a boulder beneath which is what local tradition calls a kettle full, a boat full, and a bull's hide full of gold that is Katie Nevin's hoard. And for ages past, tis well known that a pot of gold has lain at the bottom of a pool at the tail of a waterfall under the Crawfordland Bridge, three miles from Kilmarnock. The last attempt to fish it up was made by one of the lairs of the place, who diverted the stream and emptied the pool, and the implements of the workmen actually rang against the precious kettle when a mysterious voice was heard to cry, Ha! Ha! Crawford Lynn's tower's in a law! The laird and the servants scampered home to find out whether the tower had been laid law, but the alarm was only a stratagem of the spirit that did sentry duty over the treasure. When the party returned to the pool, it was filled with brim, and the water was running over the Lynn, which was an uncanny thing to see, and the laird would have nothing more to do with treasure-seeking. The people of Glenari in the highlands long swore by the legend that golden treasure was hidden in their valley, and that it would not be found until sought for by the son of a stranger. At length, while a newly drained field was being plowed, a large rock was shattered by blasting, and under it were found many solid gold bracelets of antique pattern and cunningly ornamented. The old people knew that the prophecy had come true, for the youth who held the plow was the son of an Englishman, a rare being in those parts a few generations ago. Everyone knows that Ireland is fairly peppered with crocks gold, which the peasantry would have dug up long before this, but the treasure is invariably in the keeping of the little black men, and they raise the devil and all with the bold intruder. And lucky he is if he's not snatched away body, soul, and breeches. Many a fine lad has left home just before midnight with a mattock under his arm. Maybe there was a terrible clap of thunder, and that was the last of him, excepting the hole and a mattock beside it, which his friends found the next morning. In France, treasure-seeking has been at times a popular madness. The traditions of the country are singularly alluring, and perhaps the most romantic of them is that of the great treasure of Gordon which is said to have existed since the reign of Clovis in the 6th century. The chronicle of all the wealth buried in the cemetery of this convent at Gordon in the department of the Lot has been preserved, including detailed lists of gold and silver, rubies, emeralds, and pearls. 
the convent was sacked and plundered by the normans and the treasurer or custodian who had buried all the valuables of the religious houses under the sway of the same abbot was murdered while trying to escape to the feudal seigneur of gourdon with the crozier of the lord abbot the head of the crozier was of solid gold says an ancient manuscript and the rubies with which it was studded of such wondrous size that at one single blow the soldier who tore it from the monk's grasp and used it as a weapon against him beat in his brains as with a sledge hammer not only through the middle ages was the search resumed from time to time from the latter days of the reign of louis the fourteenth until the revolution tradition relates that the cemetery of the convent was ransacked at frequent intervals at length in 1842 the quest was abandoned after antiquarians geologists and engineers had gravely agreed that further excavation would be futile the french treasure seekers went elsewhere and then a peasant girl confused the savants by discovering what was undeniably a part of the lost riches of gourdon she was driving home the cows from a pasture of the abbey lands when a shower caused her to take shelter in a hollow scooped out of a sandbank by laborers mending the road some of the earth caved in upon her and while she was freeing herself down rolled a salver a patent and a flagon all of pure gold richly chased and studded with emeralds and rubies these articles were taken to Paris and advertised for sale by auction, the government bidding them in and placing them in the museum of the Bibliothèque. During the reign of Napoleon III, there died a very famous treasure seeker, one Ducasse, who believed that he was about to discover the master treasure, the Meta Tresor, said to be among the ruins of ancient Belgian Abbey of Orval. Ducasse was a builder by trade and had gained a large fortune in government contracts, every saw of which he wasted in exploring at Orville. It was alleged that the treasure had been buried by the monks and that the word Nemo, carved on the tomb of the last abbot, held the key to the location of the hiding place. In Mexico, one hears similar tales of vast riches buried by religious orders when menaced by war or expulsion. One of these is to be found in the southwestern part of the city of Chihuahua, where a great gorge is cut by the Rio Verde. In this remote valley are the ruins of a church built by the Jesuits, and when they were about to be driven from their settlement, they sealed up and destroyed all traces of a fabulously rich mine in which was buried millions of bullion. Instead of the more or less stereotyped ghosts familiar as sentinels over buried treasure, these lost hordes of Mexico are haunted by a specter even more disquieting than phantom pirates or little black men it is the weeping woman who makes straw men cross themselves and shiver in their serapes and many have heard or seen her a member of a party seeking buried treasure in the heart of the sierra madre mountains solemnly affirmed as follows we worked measure at night a certain distance from a cliff which was to be found by the relative positions of three tall trees it was on a bleak table land nine thousand feet above the sea Wind chilled us to the marrow, although we were only a little north of the Tropic of Cancer. We rode all night and waited for the dawn in the darkest and coldest hours of those altitudes. By the light of pitch pine torches, we consulted the map and decided that we had found the right place. We rode forward a little and brushed against three soft warm things. Turning in our saddles, by the flare of our torches held high above our heads, we beheld three corpses swaying in the wind. A wailing cry of a woman's voice came from close at hand, and we fled as if pursued by a thousand demons. My comrades assured me that the weeping woman had brushed past us in her eternal flight. This is a singular narrative, but it would not be plain fair to doubt it. To be overcritical of buried treasure stories is to clip the wings of romance and to condemn the spirit of adventure to a pedestrian gait. All these tales are true, or men of sane and sober repute would not go a treasure hunting by land and sea so long as they have a high-hearted boyish faith in their mysterious charts and hazy information, doubters make a poor show of themselves and stand confessed as thin-blooded dullards who never were young. Scattered legends of many clans have been mentioned at random to show that treasure is everywhere enveloped in a glamour peculiarly its own. The base iconoclast may perhaps demolish Santa Claus, which God forbid, but industrious dreamers will be digging for the gold of Captain Kidd long after the last Christmas stocking shall have been pinned above the fireplace. There are no conscious liars among the tellers of treasure tales. The spell is upon them. They believe their own yarns, and they prove their faith by their back-breaking works with pick and shovel. Here, for example, is a specimen chosen at hazard, one from a thousand cut from the same cloth. 
This is no modern Ananias speaking, but a gray-bearded, God-fearing clam digger of Jules Island in Casco Bay on the coast of Maine. I can't remember when the treasure hunters first began coming to this island, but as long ago as my father's earliest memories, they used to dig for gold up and down the shore. That was in the days when they were superstitious enough to spill lamb's blood along the ground where they dug in order to keep away the devil and his imps. I can remember fifty years ago when they brought a girl down here and mesmerized her to see if she could not lead them to the hidden wealth. Biggest mystery, though, of all the queer things that have happened here in the last hundred years was the arrival of the man from St. John's when I was a youngster. He claimed to have the very chart showing the exact spot where Kid's gold was buried. He said he had got it from an old negro in St. John's who was with Captain Kidd when he was coasting the islands in this bay. He showed up here when old Captain Chase that lived here then was off to sea in his vessel. So he waited around a few days till the captain returned, for he wanted to use a mariner's compass to locate the spot according to the directions on the chart. When Captain Chase came ashore, the two went off up the beach together, and the man from St. John's was never seen again, neither hide nor hair of him, and it's plumb certain that he wasn't set off in a boat from Jules. Folks here found a great hole dug on the southeast shore, which looked as if a large chest had been lifted out of it. Of course, conclusions were drawn, but nobody got at the truth. Four years ago, someone found a skeleton in the woods, unburied, simply dropped into a crevice in the rocks with a few stones thrown over it. No one knows whose body it was, although some say, but never mind about that. This old Captain Jonathan Chase was said to have been a pirate, and his house was full of underground passages and sliding panels and queer contraptions, such as no honest, law-abiding man could have any use for. The worthy Benjamin Franklin was an admirable guide for young men, a sound philosopher, and a sagacious statesman, but he cannot be credited with romantic imagination. He would have been the last person in the world to lead a buried treasure expedition, or to find pleasure in the company of the most eminent and secretive pirate that ever scuttled a ship or made mysterious marks upon a well-thumbed chart, plentifully splattered with can of grease and rum. He even took pains to discourage the diverting industry of treasure-seeking as it flourished among his Quaker neighbors and discharged this formidable broadside in the course of a series of essays known as the Busybody Series. There are among us great numbers of honest artificers and laboring people who, fed with a vain hope of suddenly growing rich, neglect their business, almost to the ruining of themselves and families, and voluntarily endure abundance of fatigue in a fruitless search after imaginary hidden treasure. They wander through the woods and bushes by day, discover the marks and signs. At midnight they repair to the hopeful spots with spades and pickaxes, full of expectation. They labor violently, trembling at the same time in every joint through fear of certain malicious demons who are said to haunt and guard such places. At length a mighty hole is dug, and perhaps several cartloads of earth thrown out. But alas, no keg or iron pot is found, no seaman's chest crammed with Spanish pistols or weighty pieces of aid. They conclude that, through some mistake in the procedure, some rash word spoken, or some rule of art neglected, the guardian spirit had power to sink it deeper into the earth and convey it out of their reach. Yet, when a man is once infatuated, he is so far from being discouraged by ill success that he is rather animated to double his industry, and will try again and again in a hundred different places in hopes of meeting at last with some lucky hit that shall at once sufficiently reward him for all his expense of time and labor. This odd humor of digging for money throw a belief that much has been hidden by pirates formerly frequenting the Jilko River has for several years been mighty prevalent among us, insomuch that you can hardly walk half a mile out of town on any side without observing several pits dug with that design, and perhaps some lately opened. Men otherwise of very good sense have been drawn into the practice through an overweening desire of sudden wealth and an easy credulity of what they so earnestly wished might be true. There seems to be some peculiar charm in the conceit of finding money, and if the sands of the Shulkill were so much mixed with small grains of gold that a man might in a day's time with care and application get together to the value of half a crown, I make no question, but we should find several people employed there that can with ease earn five shillings a day at their proper trade. Many are the idle stories told of the private success of some people, by which others are encouraged to proceed, 
and the astrologers with whom the country swarms at this time are either in the belief of these things themselves or find their advantage in persuading others to believe them for they are often consulted about the critical times for digging and the method of laying the spirit and the lake whimsies which render them very necessary to and very much caressed by these poor deluded money hunters there is certainly something very bewitching in the pursuit after mines of gold and silver and other valuable metals and many have been ruined by it let honest peter buckram who has long without success been a searcher after hidden money reflect on this and be reclaimed from that unaccountable folly let him consider that every stitch he takes when he is on the shop board is picking up part of a grain of gold that will in a few days time amount to a pistol and let faber think the same of every nail he drives and every stroke with his plane such thoughts may make them industrious and in consequence in time they may be wealthy but how absurd it is to neglect a certain profit for such a ridiculous whimsy to spend whole days at the george in company with an idle pretender to astrology contriving schemes to discover what was never hidden and forgetful how carelessly business is managed at home in their absence leave their wives on a warm bed at midnight no matter if it rain hail snow or blow a hurricane provided that be the critical hour, and fatigue themselves with the violent digging for what they shall never find, and perhaps getting a cold that may cost their lives, or at least disordering themselves so as to be fit for no business beside for some days after. Surely this is nothing less than the most egregious folly and madness. I shall conclude with the words of the discreet friend Agricola of Chester County when he gave his son a good plantation. My son, said he, give thee now a valuable parcel of land i assure thee i have found a considerable quantity of gold by digging there thee mayest do the same but thee must carefully observe this never to dig more than plow deep once the illustrious franklin shot wide of the mark these treasure hunters of philadelphia who had seen with their own eyes more than one notorious pirate even blackbeard himself swagger along front street or come roaring out of the blue anger tavern by dock creek or finding their reward in the coin of romance digging mighty holes for a taskmaster would have been irksome stupid business indeed even for five shillings a day they got a fearsome kind of enjoyment in trembling violently through fear of certain malicious demons and honest peter buckram no doubt discovered that life was more zestful when he was plying shovel and pickaxe or whispering one of the astrologer in the corner of the george and during the flat hours of toil with shears and goose if the world had charted its course by poor richard's almanac there would be a vast deal more thrift and sober industry than exists but no room for the spirit of adventure which reckons not its returns in dollars and cents there are many kinds of lost treasure by sea and by land some of them however lacking the color of romance and the proper backgrounds of motive and incident have no stories worth telling for instance there were almost 5,000 wrecks on the Great Lakes during a period of 20 years, and these lost vessels carried down millions of treasure or property worth trying to recover. One steamer had $500,000 worth of copper in her hold. Divers and submarine craft and wrecking companies have made many attempts to recover these vanished riches, and with considerable success, now and then fishing up large amounts of gold, coin, and bullion. It goes without saying that the average 16-year-old boy could extract not one solitary thrill from a tale of lost treasure in the Great Lakes even though the value might be fairly fabulous. But let him hear that a number of Spanish coins have been washed up by the waves on the beach of Yucatan, and the discovery has set the natives to searching for the buried treasure of Jean Lafitte, the pirate of the Gulf, and our youngster pricks up his ears. Many noble merchantmen in modern times have foundered or crashed ashore in various seas with large fortunes in their treasure rooms, and these are sought by expeditions. But because these ships were not galleons, nor carried a freightage of doubloons and pieces of eight. Most of them must be listed in the catalogue of undistinguished sea tragedies. The distinction is really obvious. The treasure story must have the picaresque flavor, or at least concern itself, with bold deeds done by strong men in days gone by. Like wine, its bouquet is improved by age. It is the fashion to consider lost treasure as the peculiar property of pirates and galleons, and yet what has become of the incredibly vast riches of all the vanished kings despots and soldiers who plundered the races of men from the beginnings of history where is the loot of ancient home that was buried with alaric where is the dazzling treasure of samarkand where is the wealth of antioch and where are the jewels which solomon gave to the queen of sheba 
During thousands of years of warfare, the treasures of the old world could be saved from the conqueror only by hiding them underground. And, in countless instances, the sword must have slain those who knew the secret. When Genghis Khan swept across Russia with his hordes of savage Mongols, towns and cities were blotted out as by fire. And doubtless those of the slaughtered population who had gold and precious stones buried them, and there they still await the treasure seeker. What was happening everywhere during the ruthless ages of conquest and spoliation is indicated by this bit of narrative told by a native banker of India to W. Forbes Mitchell, author of Reminiscences of the Great Mutiny. You know how anxious the late Maharaja Sindhya was to get back to the fortress of Gwalior? But very few knew of the real cause prompting him. That was a concealed hoard of sixty crores, sixty million sterling of rupees in certain vaults within the fortress over which British sentinels had been walking for thirty years, never suspecting the wealth hidden under their feet. Long before the British government restored the fortress to the Maharaja, everyone who knew the entrance to the vaults was dead, except one man, and he was extremely old. Although he was in good health, he might have died any day. If this had happened, the treasure might have been lost to the owner forever and to the world for ages, because there was only one method of entrance, and it was most cunningly concealed. On all sides, except for this series of blind passages, the vaults were surrounded by solid rock. The Maharashtra was in such a situation that he must either get back to his fortress or divulge the secret of the existence of the treasure to the British government and risk losing it by confiscation. As soon as possession of the fortress was restored to him, and even before the British troops had left Gwalior territory, masons were brought in from Benares after being sworn to secrecy in the temple of the holy cow they were blindfolded and driven to the place where they were to labor there they were kept as prisoners until the hidden treasure had been examined and verified when the hole was again sealed up and the workmen were once more blindfolded and taken back to benares in the custody of an armed escort end of chapter one